All right, what's up everybody? Dr. Jaws here and happy 2024. It's a new year. So uh, we are back and uh, tonight we are going through uh, we're studying the blunt nose six gill shark Hexanthus gracious. So uh, it's good to be back. Uh, it's been a really nice uh, holiday break. Um, We've got a couple new features and a couple cool pieces of footage to go over tonight uh, with the six kill shark. Um, let's see. Cool. Sorry, I was having internet issues earlier, but it looks like everything's working uh, pretty well. So, uh, yeah, we are back. So, uh, I guess first things first, uh, just as a couple of uh, 2024 updates, nothing really major, but we've uh, changed the display a little bit. So, uh, we used to have a fossil shark timeline last year uh, on the left side of the screen, and uh, now we have this beautiful uh, bar on the top uh, that has everything from when the time that sharks first uh, appeared on the face of the earth, uh, the Devonian period, uh, stretching to the Holocene. So, um, so yeah, I really like this new layout. I think this is a bit cleaner, um, and uh, yeah, we're also trying a new musical layout. Uh, originally, I had music playing uh, kind of directly into the stream itself, and I think it's been contributing to audio issues. So one of the biggest things I want to do as far as a New Year's resolution is, uh, you know, fix the audio stuff that was happening last year. And I think this new method might work, so uh, we'll see what happens. Minjus, welcome back. It's good to see you. Happy New Year. Welcome to, uh, I guess you could say season two of uh, the live stream. So uh, did you have a good holiday season? Um, I hope you had um, some good times uh, just kind of relaxing and unwinding. Um, I spent a lot of time with family, a uh, little bit of time uh, in North Carolina with my girlfriend, which was great. Went to Cape Hatteras, which was super cool. Um, it's the uh, tallest lighthouse on the East Coast, so I was really excited about that. No sharks over the break season, but uh, even so, it was still a lot of fun. Oh, nice! Uh, Min just had a very relaxing one. Awesome. Yep, same here. Uh, spent a lot of time with family. Did a lot of traveling, actually, because um, I'm in the Hampton Roads area in Virginia, and um, my family is kind of scattered around the state, so... Um, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with these locations, but I uh, went to um, kind of the western part of the state towards Charlottesville, um, kind of the northwestern part of the state, um, kind of like in the Winchester area, and then closer to the D.C. area, and then back to the Hampton Roads area. So a lot of, a lot of traveling, um, and then uh, just came back from North Carolina for a fun adventure. Um, again, to Cape Hatteras, which is a really cool zone, actually, uh, as far as... Um, Ecology, uh, as far as uh, the Atlantic coast, um, like uh, ecoregions go, uh, Cape Hatteras is a very important transition zone between cold water uh, sea creatures and warm water sea creatures. Uh, so it was really cool to kind of be there and uh, see that zone um, up up close. So, um, so yeah, but no sharks, unfortunately, even though we do have sharks here in the winter time, uh, this time of year we have in the bay, mostly dogfish, like pike dogfish. Um, and then uh, basket sharks are really rare, but they do occur here as well. Um, offshore, you can maybe get a, a great white shark if you're lucky. Um, and a lot of the cold water species like poor beagles, uh, mako sharks, um, they'll be here too, just probably cruising offshore. Their, their distribution is a little bit more sporadic. So, but um, And the cool thing is, no matter what time of year it is... Um, Oh, hey, um, and just, I'm not too familiar with places outside New England, so it's always super cool to hear about what it's like. Oh, awesome! Actually, honestly, like... Uh, I'm kind of like, on the flip side, I love New England. Um, I think I might have mentioned last year, um, I have family in New Hampshire, um, and like specifically the Hampton area, um, like the Seacoast Science Center in Rye, uh, Odeorn Point, um, Hampton, Seabrook, like like the entire coastline I think is beautiful. Um, and honestly, like New England, I, I do uh, like, I don't wanna say envy, but like I do like really, really like that area as far as wildlife goes. Um, the first and only basking shark I've seen firsthand in real life was actually in New England in the Gulf of Maine. Um, there's a lot of really cool whale watches. Um, I think it's the Queen of the Atlantic is uh, one such. Um, I don't know like what the name of the, the whale watching charter is, but the Queen of the, I think it's called the or the Atlantic Queen. Sorry, the Atlantic Queen. I think is the name of the boat. Um, that goes out of Rye. Um, they have an amazing whale watch in the Gulf of Maine. You see humpback whales, fin whales, minke whales, 
and uh, if you're lucky, basking sharks. Uh, so that was that's that. It, it's a really cool area. Like I love I love the Gulf of Maine, as you know, because uh, like um, I made that video uh, on the channel about sharks of the Gulf of Maine. So really really cool area. Um, I believe this species, uh, Hexanthus griseus, I think the Gulf of Maine is actually its southern limit. Let's check that out really quick before we dive in more to the species. Um, and this footage pulled up uh, in the background. Let's put a pause in that for a second. Uh, let's check the range really quick uh, on IUCN Red List for Hexanthus griseus, the blunt nose six skill shark. So. Um, let me know, uh, uh, let me know if the music is, uh, at a good level, by the way. I have some background music, uh, Minecraft specifically, because I think it's, uh, pretty relaxing. Um, but, uh, let me know if it's, uh, too loud or too soft, uh, in the comments. Uh, we're trying a new audio setup to make sure that my actual, um, speaking audio is not interrupted in any way, so. Um, oh, cool. Um, uh, we're watching something that's... Oh my gosh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I, I just saw your comment, Minjus. Yeah, whale watching, uh, like, I highly recommend Rye, New Hampshire. Like, I highly recommend... Oh, good, music volume sounds good on my end. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, like, I really appreciate that, because I think this new arrangement is going to help with audio overall. But anyway, um, Rye, New Hampshire, I highly recommend. Um, I don't think you can go wrong uh, with any of the whale watch operators from, from Rye. Uh, it's, it, like, they're fantastic. The place that I go, the location they go out to is awesome. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great chance to see not just whales, but um, if, if anyone uh, is like a birder, uh, seabirds are, there's, there's a couple seabirds that you can't really see on the coastline. You actually have to be out in the water, um, like storm petrels or um, uh, what's the one? Gannets? Northern gannets? Um, gannets. Um, Oh, what's that? Um, puffins. Uh, puffins are a big thing. Um, I have actually, uh, I saw a puffin last year in Virginia, which is wild. You never, like, like it was March, and, like, you never think a puffin would be down here that far, but uh, it can happen. And so, um, and I know New England is a bigger puffin spot. Um, but yeah, uh, whale watching is a great, great experience to see whales, um, a lot of cool seabirds, really cool fish like ocean sunfish. Um, that's a big thing in New, ha uh, in New England as well. And then uh, some awesome sharks. So um, looking at this map, I know this map is saying from IUCN Red List that the six skill shark is not in New England, but I just want to double check that. I want to see if there's another map because I could have sworn this species went up that far. Because yeah, on fish base... The fish base map is saying it could be found there, and it makes sense because this is a deep water species, um, and because it lives in deeper habitat, um, you know, it kind of is used to like a, unif a more uniform temperature range, um, so there really wouldn't be that big of a difference between like the Virginia mid-Atlantic area and like the New England area, um, so I would imagine this is in like further north. Um, and yeah, there's, there's like a sighting thing from... Um, what is this? GBIF. A couple pings. Uh, this is Nova Scotia, Massachusetts area. And that's not really loading from fish base. So I am pretty sure. Uh, let's check out. This is a shameless plug, but I'm kind of a nerd about. Well, I'm definitely a nerd about um, where sharks live. So let's just check out the Dr. Jaws website really quick. Um, I do have to update this website, but um, I do have a section on ecoregions, and I make a checklist of sharks that could be found in different areas. So, um, in New England, so the Gulf of Maine, Bay of Fundy ecoregion, let's see, uh, I forgot, this is kind of ridiculous how I organized it. Um, I guess it's not on my list, so, okay. So yeah, I guess the six skill shark is not uh, that far up. Let me check one more thing, um, just because it, it just makes sense for it to be up there. Okay, so I'm looking at um, our good friend Sharks of the World, and it does have a potential distribution map for New England. So it, the, the northern limit of verified distribution is Virginia, which is actually really cool, but um, there's a potential distribution for New England. Which makes sense because it's a cold water species. You can find it up in Alaska. You can find it up in Iceland. Like it, it makes sense that you could probably find six skill sharks in New England. 
Um, so yeah, sorry, a little bit of a tangent uh, for the species, but um, yeah. So, oh cool. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I just saw your comment, Ninja. Sorry. Um, not to get further off track, I didn't know puffins can get uh, far south as Virginia. I didn't know either. I, I, that really shocked me, actually. Um, and I really was not expecting that at all. Um, and I guess it makes sense, because, uh, like, I don't know if the Labrador current currently, go uh, or, like, like technically goes down. I mean, it, it, I mean, it does, like, like I think the, the Labrador current proper is, like, around kind of around like the um like canada like 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 the atlantic provinces area i don't think the labrador current proper is technically down this coastline but um but i think some definitions of labrador current extend to the virginia echo region and like um with it like comes a lot of cold water wildlife including puffins so um i don't know if the puffins were kind of like flying with the current uh going after prey items i was absolutely shocked um especially with march uh just like even though march is still very cold um as far as the water temperature goes uh it's it's still the very beginning of like things changing into summer life so i was really happy with it but i, I just was um it, it's bizarre to think about <laughs> so because you think of puffins being in you know very very cold water so but anyway uh yeah uh, so overall, uh, the holiday season was really good. I'm very excited to start out the new year uh, with a lot of new sharks. Uh, last year was kind of the year of the lamniforms, so I'm curious to see how 2024 turns out in terms of the species we cover. Uh, this species, the blunt-nosed six-scale shark, I thought would be a really good one to start out with because it is one of the very few hexantriforms. So these are kind of sometimes called the fossil sharks or um, cow sharks. Um, they kind of have more of a primitive look. Uh, they do not have two dorsal fins. They only have the single dorsal fin. Um, they have kind of like a... I, I, I try to shy away from the term like primitive or prehistoric appearance because it's like... And in one sense, it, you can make that argument, but in the other sense, it's like... It's like every creature that is alive today, you can't describe as a prehistoric creature. It's it's like, you know, it, it, it's just as evolved, if you will, than as as other groups you know so i i um i kind of shy away from that definition but anyway some people describe uh this group of sharks as the most ancient looking um and i guess that makes sense since maybe the primitive sharks were kind of more more along the lines of um the six scale shark uh seven gill shark and the field shark so um but uh these are beautiful species uh very big uh they do get to be a pretty good size let me see what sharks in the world says uh, maximum, uh, maximum is about 3.3 meters or 4 meters, so it's about 12-ish feet, like 10 to 12-ish feet. Sorry, maximum size, that's what I was just looking at. Maximum size is possibly 5.5 meters. meters. So, 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 going back, going back to, to meters, meters and feet, 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 that would be, um, um, but I have my own because I can't do that. Off the top of my head, I have my own time. 5.5. 18 feet, possibly. So, so. Oh, oh no, no, no. The rackling the audio showed up again, but it's not as bad as, bad as usual, usual, so that's good. Okay, 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 okay thank okay, you. Thank yeah, you. that's yeah, scary. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, uh, thank you for pointing out, out that out there, because at this point, point um, maybe, maybe, maybe another maybe new user resolution, I should probably invest in a new computer, to be honest. So, um, shameless plug, by the way, uh, I run this off of a 20, like, like, like a pretty old Mac that's actually kicking, uh, still. It's, it's... Uh, I probably, I probably, like, I probably shouldn't disclose how old this computer is, but, like, um, I, it, it's, performance-wise, uh, I really, I, I'm quite happy with, uh, the, the MacBook. It's, it's a very good, very reliable, uh, computer. But anyway, so, let's check out some footage, and actually, before we do, um, our good friend Howard Care submitted some art for tonight. So, um, I had it pulled up, let's see. Open recent. Do, 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 do. And he actually sent over a lot of cool fossils. So um, let's let me go ahead and pull this up. There we go. So I got a lot of funny files here. All right. So this is an awesome piece of art from Howard Care, uh, our good friend um, from Canada. Um, I really love that we're starting the, year, the new year off right. 
Uh, it's really cool to see Howard's signature with the 24 next to it, so signifying uh, 2024, the new year, because uh, Howard started joining us last year in 2023, so it's, it's just really cool to see a new number. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is an awesome piece of art with uh, just that you know really heavy um, head and jaw character or characteristic of the species. Uh, of course, the six skills for Hexantius Crucius. Uh, it's kind of a cool scientific name. Hex uh, means six, like hexagon. Um, Grisius means, I want to say that actually is a word in reference to gray. Um, sorry, I'll also open up my Excel. Uh, I believe Fishbase has a translation. Uh, let's see. Uh, Grisius, medieval Latin for gray, reflecting the French, the French vernacular le grisier, uh, referring to its dark gray coloration. Okay. Uh, Hexantius, hex is six. Anchus, uh, um, etymology unclear, perhaps anchus, choke or throttle, referring to how the six skill openings of this species extend down onto the throat. Very cool. So, um, yeah. let's go back because this is pretty cool footage. Um, but yeah, I really love also uh, Howard's attention to de detail. Uh, what's kind of cool is that we have Hexentius Grisius, but in what looks like kind of a kelp environment. And what's really cool is that there's a cousin of this shark species, uh, Notorhynchus sepidanus. Uh, is a, it's another kind of um, cow shark or uh, six gill shark. Um, let, me sh let me make sure Notorhynchus. No, sorry, Notorhynchus is a seven gill shark. My apologies. Uh, seven gill shark, but um, that that. That seven gill shark species is in um, kind of kelp forest environments in the Pacific, which is really cool. So I really like kind of like the connection with that, um, kind of the nod to that. I feel like Hexentius grisius is a bit more of a deep water species, but uh, we'll take a look at its biology tonight to see what kinds of habitats uh, it goes into. But I really love this artwork. Um, it's such a cool shark, and I really appreciate uh, this particular individual in the foreground with like that characteristic jawline almost kind of curving into a smile the big bulging eyes and then of course like these gorgeous like uh, gills like like this you can't see it anywhere else like these these multiple like these six gills like most sharks have of course five gills and to have a species that have six gills is just it's a really cool unique feature so uh, thank you Howard for submitting this piece of art this is awesome um, we're gonna take a look at uh, Howard sent over some other things so here is kind of an amazing fossil of um, Hexantius grisius, uh, or Hexantius from the Cretaceous period. So this is unbelievable, even though it looks uh, a bit amorphous as far as fossils go, the fact that anything shark-related fossilizes beyond the teeth is really a miracle uh, because the cartilage is so much more sensitive than any kind of bone. So the fact that you can have a preserved specimen like this um, you know, like, like any kind of like fossil impression like this from a shark is, is really, truly a, a rare find. Um, so this is just really cool to see. Um, resolution is a little blurry, but I think if I'm not, if I'm seeing that correctly, that's a bit of the jaw, like the Meckel's cartilage right there. Um, and you can see, of course, the vertebrae extending into the elongate tail right here. Um, they could probably identify this uh, fossil to species based on the tooth. Um, I did pull up a really cool website uh, with that we saw a lot more in the beginning of last year. This is uh, fossilguy.com. Uh, for any shark fossil related questions, I highly recommend this website. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go, well, yeah, let's check out like, Let's see. I want to see if I can get to the homepage really quick. Just just to plug fossilguy.com. Um, th this website is fantastic. Uh, it's definitely the best resource I've seen online as far as um, shark tooth hunting, where to look for shark teeth, um, where to look for a lot of different kinds of fossils. But I feel like shark teeth is like one of the big um, uh, offerings from this particular website. Uh, for me personally, when I go fossil hunting, I refer to the site quite often. So... Um, but they had a really beautiful diagram of the unique tooth type of Hexantius grisius, um, tonight's species, where unlike most sharks, which have like a single blade or single uh, crown or cusp on a tooth, um, uh, six scale sharks have multiple cusplets, uh, multiple blades uh, on each tooth. So in particular, this is um, eight to 12, I think from this 
picture is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, so nine teeth uh, on, uh, or sorry, nine cusplets on a single tooth, which is a really cool and unique shape to see. Um, I don't think I have a six gill or seven gill in my collection, um, but I would I would be thrilled to find one of these. Um, you know, like, like going fossil tooth hunting. Um, there's just nothing else like it. It's this beautiful comb shape um, that is quite prominent still, um, even though it's this one single tooth. Um, it's still like these really beautiful prominent blades. Um, specifically looking at this kind of, um, this tooth guide, we have fine serrations on the, um, mesial side of the first cup. Um, mesial is heading towards the middle of the mouth, uh, or maybe the front of the mouth, if you will. Distal is heading towards the back of the mouth. Um, so it's kind of like these, if, if you had a comparison to humans, like the mesial side is kind of heading towards like the, um, the front teeth, and then the distal side is heading towards the molars, if you had a comparison to humans. So, um, but um, many cusps, 8 to 12, that get smaller towards the distal end. Uh, thin, flat, uh, rectangular, rectangular root? Interesting, rectangular. I don't know if that's a misspelling of rectangular, or if that is something kind of different, or if that's like a British or English... A, d a different kind of uh, English spelling of rectangular. I don't know. I've never seen that before. I don't know if that's a misprint or if that's actually like something else, like like aluminum versus aluminium. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, really cool tooth guide. Really cool tooth guide on the unique teeth of these species. So, um, and then this is. I don't think we've ever talked about symphyseal teeth or symphyseal teeth, but these are the very tiny teeth. Um, in the very center of the jaw of a shark uh, that uh, I'm not really exactly sure what the function is of symphyseal teeth but um, it is, it's a very tiny tooth at the dead center of the front of a shark's jaw and then um, the other main teeth um, you know, go in these rows um, around the symphyseal tooth so. but anyway uh, let's go ahead and just take a look at some footage of living specimens and um, Hey, Howard, what's up? Uh, welcome back. Sorry, I just saw your comments, so... Uh, let's see. So, Oh, my gosh. And thank, thank you, Minjus. This is great. Um, so, uh, about um, uh, Howard's art... Let's see. Do, 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 do. They, may, they mean rectangular. Gotcha. Okay, sorry. It just took me a second to uh, uh, read the comments, but... Um, Howard, thank you so much. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you so much for uh, submitting uh, yet another beautiful piece of art uh, with Hexentius Grisius. Um, this is a really, really cool piece, and I, I got a personal kick seeing the 24 next to your uh, uh, insignia or uh, signature. Uh, it's really cool to, to be entering another year with um, you know our community. It's, it's just really, really cool to think that like we've done, or we did, I can't speak proper English tonight. <laughs> Like we did, we completed a full year of Dr. Dawes Live, and uh, we're starting out anew uh, for 2024, uh, a new chapter. Uh, so this is really cool. This this art is beautiful. I really love uh, the six skills in the foreground. So thank you so much for sending this in. And uh, we were just talking about uh, the fossil impression you sent in. Um, we're going over fossilguide.com, uh, a familiar friend uh, of the stream that um, we're checking out uh, the um, Hexantius uh, tooth type on that website, so uh, pretty cool. And um, I also, uh, real briefly, uh, this is awesome. We were talking about um, tiger sharks. I think it was last stream, or may uh, yeah, I think the holiday special with Jess, we were talking about tiger sharks and how there was actually multiple species of tiger shark. And uh, this is just really cool follow-up. Uh, thank you again for submitting this, Howard, of the different kinds of tiger shark species uh, that swam in oceans long ago. So we have um, Iglesani, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, Latidens, Aduncus, another potential Aduncus, many Aduncus, Galusudo Cuvier, the modern tiger shark right here. Um, and it's really cool to see some of the subtle differences um, in this Aduncus, a uh, little bit of like a fatter blade uh, for um, like the tooth on the um, left right here. Uh, shark teeth are really, really hard to identify sometimes because it's not just like a particular tooth can be of a particular species, but it's also like a particular tooth 
can be in a particular position in the mouth of a particular species. Like, like teeth can look just so different from one part of the mouth to another and from one species to another. So uh, it is pretty extraordinary to, to see that um, we can actually ident like classify teeth onto spe two species level um, and have multiple species of tiger sharks. So this is awesome. I love that they're all tiger sharks and they're all distinguished by like the heart-shaped tooth that is kind of unique to tiger sharks. Um, but still, this is really cool to see that there wasn't just Galliocero cuvier, but uh, a lot of cousins in the past. Uh, so this is really amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, is this your uh, Galliocero latidens? Because um, it, it's a beautiful specimen. Um, and if so, oh, I, I was going to ask where it's from, but I see Eocene Belgium. So really, really cool. So. Um, and actually, yeah, I'm just noticing the distributions of um, these fossil teeth. It's actually kind of amazing to see how disparate they are. We have California, Florida, Indonesia, Morocco, Alabama, South Carolina. Very, very cool. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. And um, wow. Uh, yeah, this is just really cool. Yeah, it's Belgian. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you, Howard. So yeah, very, very cool to see. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, for tonight, um, oh, I, I sorry, I had one more uh, thing to say. Um, I said this at the top of the stream, but we changed the layout a little bit. So at the very top of your screen, you can see our fossil time, uh, shark timeline has changed. So we've made it a very, I think this looks a bit cleaner. Um, this nice horizontal layout from the Devonian to the Holocene. So, um, that tooth we just saw is from the Eocene, so this is 56 to 34 million years ago in like the light green on the very top of the screen. So um, I kind of like this layout a little bit better. I was telling Min just at the uh, top of the stream that we're changing the music as well, um, where the point being I want to have clearer audio and less audio interruptions. That's my New Year's resolution for 2024. So um, hopefully this will work for tonight. Uh, it seems like it's already been a bit better. So. Um, but yeah, uh, but my favorite thing is just like changing out the fossil timeline uh, to make it at the top of the screen. So, but yeah, uh, all that being said, I think it's time to fully dive into the blunt nose six gill shark. So I've been replaying this clip over and over, but this is a really, really cool um, shot of the species from uh, YouTuber John Sanders. Subscribe. Um, and I'm curious, does he describe where this is from? Do, 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 do. Large female, eight feet, two medium sharks, seven, six to seven feet, one five feet. Let's see. Yeah, so no description in terms of like where this is, but it's really great footage of the species, and it's actually really cool to see a couple features of the species. So, uh, aside from the obvious one where you know you just have the one dorsal fin and the multiple gills, um, you do see this light colored lateral line on the side of the body. Um, we'll get another view of that, and just this beautiful billowing tail. Um, you can see it's a larger animal, uh, so six gill sharks are pretty heavy bodied. Um, I love also in your artwork, Howard, you capture that they ha their mouth kind of angles into like almost like a smile, uh, which is really cool to see. And what's interesting is that there are divers in this video. So this is somewhere shallow, probably at night. So we can assume that uh, this particular individual six gill shark uh, may have made a deal migration, meaning that it came from deep water uh, up to shallow water uh, to forage. There we go. That's kind of the lateral line I was talking about. See, actually, you can see it really clearly, these individual little dots right here. This is a, a pressure sensing um, feature that is uh, shared between sharks and uh, other fish have this as well. Um, this is a wonderful feature that enables a shark to feel uh, changes in water pressure, uh, specifically if a, a foot uh, like if a fish is swimming, um, you know the the pressure that a fish affects on the water as far as the tail hitting the water. Um, pushes against the lateral line of the shark and causes the shark to feel the vibration and um, causes it to kind of know from a distance, like, okay, there's a fish or a potential prey item pretty close to me. So, uh, which is really cool to see. So this shark is very elongate. 
Um, so it has relatively moderately sized pectoral fins, a uh, pretty thick, long body, uh, very long um, pelvic fins, actually. They're very broad. They're almost, uh, they're actually this beautiful, uh, almost like spade shape or triangular shape um, that are a bit unusual compared to other sharks when you look at that. Um, even the second, or sec, or sorry, the, the only dorsal fin and uh, the anal fin, both of them are a bit elongate as well. Like the pectoral fins look a little bit more like a classic shark, but towards the back of the body, the other fins seem a bit more like compressed, like a little bit more stretched out, which is really cool. And culminating in this unique um, tail fin or caudal fin, ooh, there's another individual. Um, culminating is in this unique caudal fin that is just almost like a single blade. So, excuse me. Um, why, this is a pretty long clip, so while this is playing, I'm going to reference Sharks of the World, um, our wonderful handy dandy guide, and see if there's anything um, new or interesting um, from that. So, let's see. Do, 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 do. Interesting. Um, so, uh, Sharks of the World says uh, six, six scale sharks have small eyes, dark pupils ringed with light, uh, white, fluorescent, blue, green in life. Um, the note that it's fluorescent uh, strikes me as pretty interesting in terms of like, I wonder if there's a reason why um, the shark's uh, irises, if you will, are blue green. That's pretty interesting. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Yep, light colored lateral line and trailing on uh, fin edges. So uh, I guess the that light colored lateral line I was talking about is actually an identifying feature for the species, which uh, it's so subtle, you wouldn't think that that would be something that you can use to identify the blunt nose six skill shark, but uh, that's actually really cool. So didn't know that that was something charismatic to the species. Uh, it has a patchy distribution uh, worldwide, possibly absent from the Arctic and Antarctic. This shark likes uh, shelves and slopes of continents, islands, seamounts, and mid-ocean ridges, usually 200 to 1,100 meters to at least 2,500 meters. So this is a shark that likes to be in the midnight zone or the twilight zone. But again, it's interesting seeing scuba divers in this particular clip, which m makes me think that uh, these six scale sharks swam closer to the surface at night, probably following prey items. Um, that also live in the deep and that also go to the surface at night. Let's see. These sharks are often associated with areas of upwelling and high biological productivity. That's really cool. Um, so I'm assuming, I, I know it said it, but like um, continental shelves, like areas like, I, I know if we've talked about upwelling before, but if you have um, a continental shelf, um, so basically, like, you have this smooth continental plane and then a drop-off to the abyss, if you will. Um, that ge ge geological feature uh, creates an interesting dynamic in the ocean where uh, water will collide with that kind of um, shelf edge and rapidly rise up and help mix nutrients, like bring, nu like bring interesting nutrients from the deep to shallower sunlit waters um, and the nutrients help create more of like a plankton bloom and um, the like in turn this sets off kind of a chain reaction where there's like zooplankton eating the plankton, little uh, fish uh, eating the zooplankton, so on and so forth. Uh, so shelf areas because of the upwelling, um, so deep water rising or colliding into like, um, like a canyon wall or colliding into a continental shelf um, wall if you will. Um, brings nutrients from the deep up to the surface in a way that wouldn't happen usually in a, any other circumstance. And that sets off a chain reaction where there's unusually high biological productivity in those regions. Um, this is why a lot of whales uh, or mako sharks or uh, a pelagic life like dolphins, like common dolphins specifically, or seabirds, they love upwelling areas because they are really biologically productive so it's really cool to see that this particular shark species also likes to be near continental shelves and areas of upwelling uh, for the same reason they they are very productive and great sources of food uh, or food items for um, a lot of kinds of uh, critters so I just noticed by the way in this clip um, let me rewind just a little bit 
This is a really good shot of, uh, see the little hole right here? This is a very small spiracle, um, kind of on the side of the shark's head. So spiracle uh, in shark evolution is a very highly modified, the hypothesis or the theory is like it's a very highly modified uh, gill slip. So let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, hydrographic data from areas where blunt nose six seal sharks occur reveal a bottom temperature of 6 to 10 degrees Celsius in waters with high nutrient levels. Interesting. Young may occur close inshore in cool water, and adults are more likely to be found in shallow water close to submarine canyons. Interesting. Uh, again, I wish there was a location on this because that would be really cool to see um, exactly where this is filmed um, to, to kind of cross reference um, where, uh, like, like, like some, some of these notes on the shark's biology. Do, 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 do. Adult females move inshore seasonally to give birth, with the newborns occurring in very shallow water nursery areas off the co west coast of North America in Monterey Bay, Puget Sound, and adjacent waters of British Columbia. This is cool. Wow. There's also a nursery off the coast of southern uh, Namibia. Let's see. Observed by uh, some behavior on uh, six skill sharks. Oh, this is cool. This individual's looking at, I'm assuming it might be, I think it's a weight. I thought it was a bait item for a second, but it looks like it's a weight. Oh, this one's got a fish. Look at that. Um, observed by divers in shallow water, filmed from submersibles, and tracked for short distances. The shark occurs alone or in groups. It's a slow but strong swimmer. Adult sharks are more sensitive to light than juveniles and less likely to be seen in clear shallow water, but may approach the surface at night during dense plankton blooms. So that's kind of cute, actually. So little baby six-scale sharks, um, they don't mind like the sunlit waters, but then the adults, you know, can't bear the light and would like to be closer to the darkness is where they 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 feel most at home which i think is really cool um you can make a good poem or short story about that i think so oh at least one confirmed non-fatal attack by this species on a hookah diver gathering clams in puget sound washington usa a possible second non-fatal attack by a large cow shark at the Farallon Islands off San Francisco may have been this species or the large and potentially aggressive Notorhynchus sepidanus. Interesting. Uh, wildly enough, okay, this shark is also viviparous, so it gives live birth to very large litters of 47 to 108 pups. So that's pretty big. That's actually really successful for a shark. Uh, so that's actually pretty good on productivity um let's see do, 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 do. this is a possibly long-lived species it eats squid uh benthic and pelagic bony fishes small sharks and rays uh large sharks at least two meters take on cetaceans so potentially dolphins porpoises and seals very interesting so all right so there's actually quite a lot to the species um let me catch up on the comments while this footage is uh, I mean, let's see. Oh, interesting. Uh, Minjus, I, I saw your comment. Uh, I was just about to ask about the gill slits. Um, does the lack of the seventh gill slit make their internal anatomy, anatomy any different when compared to sharks with uh, seven? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so... I'm not really sure, um, that's a really good question, and I'm not really sure what the, that's actually a really good question, um, because that, that actually gets into a bigger subject of why, because I believe five gill slits uh, is a new feature as far as shark evolution goes, so why did sharks evolve five gill slits as opposed to six or seven? Um, what is the advantage of having fewer gill slits? And um, I'm not sure. Uh, my it, that's a, that's actually an excellent question. Let me start that because my guess would be um, that I wonder if maybe too many gill slits might be inefficient, and so it might be as far as evolution goes better to have fewer gill slits where it's like maybe the six and seven are not as necessary uh for respiration is a potential guess but i'm not 100 percent sure that is absolutely just a guess from my part um that's an excellent question i actually i really hope uh 
some of the uh, resources we look at tonight, I hope they maybe answer that or go into that a little bit. Um, yeah, that's actually a really cool question. I never thought about it. Like, what, what the difference would be or the advantage would be. Um, as far as your original question with six gills versus seven gills, um, I'm not really sure off the top of my head about that either. Because uh, I, would, I would say the major difference is five gills versus six or seven. Um, so, cause it's like most shark species have five gills and that leads me to believe that there's something incredibly successful about the five gill slits versus the six or seven gill slits. And I, I'm guessing it's something to do with like efficiency for respiration where it's like, if your body is not producing an extra gill slit, it could be investing that energy into producing a different feature, like, like a second dorsal fin. Um, so, but I don't know, this is all completely guesswork on my end. So, uh, that's an excellent excellent scientific question and uh i hope we kind of get some answers tonight so that'll be really cool um oh nice uh i just saw your comment you did bring up the spiracle i assume that means a third fourth gill arch is high, highly modified to fit it at least that's my guess that's a really good point too um so yeah actually that's a really good guess um yeah, let's keep an eye out uh, as we uh kind of look through some of the research tonight and some of the cliff notes on six skill sharks um that's really really cool so uh you know what actually let's there's so much footage to go over i do kind of want to hop around really quick to see if there's something um about that let's see biology okay here we go this is florida museum of natural history uh, blunt of six skill shark closely resembles fossil forms dating from the Triassic period, approximately 200 million years ago. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Six skill slits. Most sharks only have five. Do, 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 do. Mm hmm. Reproduction, don't need that. Yeah, Floyd Museum doesn't have a note on that. Fish base is not going to have anything on that, I swear, but let's just check it anyway. Uh huh. It's actually a pretty good fish base uh, profile. Okay. Um, shark references might have something. Hmm. Oh, uh, that's actually, um, this is not what we're looking for, but these are actually excellent pictures of the jaws. Um, man, modern six skill shark teeth. So, um, are these the, I'm assuming, yeah, these are the top teeth. So fewer cusps. So three in this particular tooth, four in this tooth. Pretty nasty looking, actually. Uh, here's here's the symphysial tooth, by the way. This is I was awkwardly trying to describe it. It's kind of hard to describe without showing it, but the, this is a symphysial tooth. This tiny little tooth in the middle, between the rows of like the um, kind of more standardized shark teeth. Um, this little one is a symphysial, and then these are like the classic teeth. So, uh, but it's really cool to see this modern six gill shark tooth. Um, it's very similar to. The fossil teeth that we actually you know unmistakably kind of the same as like the fossil teeth it's really cool to see how conserved shark evolution is really um does it show this one is from aurora north carolina but it doesn't show how old it is but still pretty impressive one two three four five six seven eight nine also nine uh nine rows that's a nice closer view of the symphysial tooth and the other teeth so very cool um wow these are nice teeth um let's see i'm gonna do a quick control find evolution uh 
uh, this is truckreferences.com. This is the complete list of all the publicly, well, all the all the research has ever been um, conducted on this species. All the publications on the six gill sharks. Uh, I love this website, um, and specifically, it's kind of cool to see if we could find something about gill evolution. Uh, that might be promising. I don't know if I can get to that since it doesn't have the green button, but... Oh, I guess I can. This is a good rabbit hole, actually. I, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Oh. As for... Uh, interesting note. As for the observed ontogenic diet change of the living blood-nosed six-skill shark... Its ancestors appear to have developed a similar penchant for dining on marine mammals at the end of the Paleogene with a remarkably well-correlated timing. Interesting. Uh, but I don't think... Can we see the whole article? Full article. Can I see this whole article? Uh, nope. You gotta pay to play. That uh, sucks. Yeah. And I can't stream something that you have to pay for. So, Okay. Probably wouldn't have had what we were looking for anyway, but I was kind of curious about that. So, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. No. Molecular species, phylogeny, no. No. Evolutionary relations of forms DP sharks elucidated by whole money. Uh, that might have something. Hmm. I'm just going to scan this really quick over a cup of just Lipton's black tea. It's the classic black tea. This is not sponsored by Lipton's, but Lipton's is solid if you need just a standard black tea. Hmm. Did you know, by the way, I might have mentioned this before, Peter Jackson directed the uh, three Lord of the Rings movies on tea. He did not drink coffee. He drank, he drank tea while directing those movies. Uh, which boggles my mind. I don't know how you could possibly do that, but tea was his drink of toy, uh, choice. So. Anyway. Do, 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 do. Whole monochrome DNA. Oh, interesting. Um... The monophyly of hexantroforms and, and its close relation with all of the squalform sharks was strong supported. This is kind of cool. So, um, just briefly looking at the abstract of this paper, um, it's saying that hexantroforms, um, so six scale sharks and frill sharks, um, are in a kind of a shared clad or single clad or a monophyly with squalform sharks, which are like dogfish. Which makes sense because you know those are those are both kind of classically defined. They're, they're classically described as like more ancient sharks or kind of more like prehistoric sharks. Um, you know, Carcharinoforms is a very modern, modern, if you will, um, kind of group. Uh, Lambdaforms is not as modern, but it's still closely related to Carcharinoforms. Um, kind of makes sense that Hexandroforms and Squalforms are kind of more closely related to each other. Oh, hey, here we go. This might be it, Minjus. Uh, based on our phylogeny, we discussed evolutionary scenarios of the jaw suspension mechanism and gill slit numbers that are significant features in the sharks. Oh, okay. This might be onto something. I'm very curious about this question. So let's let's just shout out to this. This is evolutionary relations of hexantiforms, deep sea sharks elucidated by whole mitochondrial genome sequences by Kiko Tanaka, uh, Takashi Shina, Takateru Tomata, uh, Shingo Suzuki, uh, Kazuyoshi Hosomishi, Kazumi Sano, Hiroyuki Doi, uh, Azumi Kono, Tomoyoshi Komiyama, Haide Toshi Inoko, Jersey K. Koski, and Sho Tanaka. Okay. And apologies if I did not pronounce that in some of those names correctly. So, 
Uh, but I'm going to control find gills. I do want to see if there's some elucidation on gill slot numbers in terms of like what that might be about. So let's see. Do, 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 do. Hexantroforms is regarded as an ancient order of sharks with just five extant species that are characterized by having only one dorsal fin, either six or seven gill clefts, and no nictitating membranes in the eyes. So, okay. Derived features, for example, the extra gill arch and more heart valve rows shared with other hexantroforms support its retention within hexantroforms. Interesting. Oh, uh, wait a minute. And they're talking about frill sharks being weird. Okay, frill sharks are different from cow sharks. So our shark, the blunt-nosed six-scale shark, is described as a cow shark. Um, so, and it, like, like... Six gill sharks and seven gill sharks are described as cow sharks, and I'm assuming it's because they're kind of like fat and slow, is my guess, in terms of why they're called cow sharks. And then the frilled shark is very much not like that. The frilled shark is like kind of more like this creepy eel like thing. Um, so they're in, the, they're in the same order, but this is just talking about how frilled sharks are just very weird compared to the cow sharks. But let's keep looking. Features of sharks. Okay. Six or seven gill clefts and one dorsal fin were observed in the Hexantroform species, whereas five gill clefts and two dorsal fins were observed in, like, basically everything else. Oh. Oh, interesting. Okay. So this is really cool. Uh, again, Minjus, I'm really glad you asked this question because this is very interesting. Uh, so this is a really cool... Um, I wish I had a better view of this. Um, this is a really cool phylogenetic tree of um, including sharks or rays, and these numbers right here, the six, six or seven, five or six, five, I don't know if you can see that. Um, these numbers right here refer to the number of gill slits. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit further. I think it's really interesting. So uh, what's interesting is that you can see here, this is a million years ago, so this is 203 million years ago. Let's check out our new timeline. Um, that's the Triassic period. Oh, hold on, I'm losing my place. Triassic period. Um, so this is where batoids, so these are rays, uh, batoids are all skates and rays, uh, split off from sharks. So uh, batoids have five or six gill slits. Then you get to the ancestor of all modern sharks here, uh, which is 149 million years ago. Um, that is, I might have to rethink of where I put the timeline because, oh, actually, no, that works. The Jurassic period. So back in the Jurassic period, you have the galeomorphs, which are, um, oh, interesting. The squaliforms, lamniforms, carcarinoforms. Wait a minute. No, 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 that's not correct. I'm sorry. That's not correct. Nope. We gotta start this new year out right. I am so sorry about that. That's absolutely that's absolutely wrong. Sorry. I did this. I think I did this last year too. I always get squall morphs and galleon morphs confused. Let's. Here we go. Da, 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 da. I always I always do this. It's it's kind of basic. Um, it's I I feel like in like most classic shark. Classifications, um, this is not really talked about too, too much, but um, it's actually really important, so... No, 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 I want Squalomorphs. There you go, Squalomorphy. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. I, I, I got thrown off for a second. So, 
Um, really brief, because uh, I know we talked about this last year too. There's two major groups of sharks, the squalomorphs and the galeomorphs. Um, it's something to do with how the jaw, the jaw is structured. Um, like it's something to do with jaw structure and other features in terms of like how they're divided. Um, a kind of very dumb basic uh, split for me, at least, is squalomorphs are kind of more like the ancient sharks. Galeomorphs are kind of more like the modern sharks. So squalomorphs are hexantiforms, like the six skill shark that we're reviewing tonight. Squaliforms, like dogfish. Squatiniforms, like the angel sharks and pristiaforiforms like the saw sharks. So these are all part of the, squal uh, the squalomorphs. They're all one group. And when we go back to this little chart, the squalomorphs uh, broke off from the galeomorphs sometime during the Jurassic period. So these guys all appear as the squalomorphs. Sorry, this little, this little bar of, with the actual like um, um, shark drawings threw me off because it, it put the... Uh, uh, the dogfish, Squalus acanthus, Squalus pacificus, it put them in the very close to the galeomorph section, which is kind of irritating because uh, these are not galeomorphs. So, uh, galeomorphs, the modern sharks, if you will, are heterodontiforms, um, the bullhead sharks, uh, erectiloviforms, the carpet sharks, like the whale shark, landiforms, like the great white ma mackerel sharks, and then carcarinoforms, like bull sharks, uh, ground sharks. So, um, sorry about that. I just wanted to do a shout out for squall morphs versus galeomorphs. Uh, but anyway, the galeomorphs, again, these like modern sharks, like great white sharks, split off from the squall morphs around the Jurassic period. They have five gill slits. Uh, for the squall morphs, um, there is a split where you have the cow sharks, like the hexantiforms, um, splitting off from the squall morphs around 110 million years ago, which is. I got this, the Cretaceous period. So it's really cool to see. Oops, sorry. Uh, Cretaceous period. It's kind of cool to see these steps, like um, Jurassic, Tri or sorry, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, uh, as far as these major changes um, in sharks. Uh, so the hexantiforms, like our uh, cow shark split off, or our um, six scale shark split off from the other squalomorphs during the Cretaceous period. And then the frill shark being weird uh, split off from the other uh, uh, hexantiforms 78 million years ago. So that is also the Cretaceous period. So um, so these, so our six gill shark, which has six or seven gill slits, uh, the frill shark, which has six gill slits, um, they split off from the other squalomorphs, which have five or six gill slits. I don't know which squalomorph. I, I, I forget which squalomorph has possibly six gill, um, gill slits. But um, the multiple gill slits, um, for the most part, seems to be an ancestral trait. The galeomorphs seem to have firmly reduced it to five gill slits, but the other groups um, seem to potentially retain six or seven. So... I was a little bit too long-winded, so I my apologies. I just kind of got th thrown off by the whole um, just just how this was drawn. Uh, it just was kind of a little weird. So, but let's go back to what we were looking for, which is why are there multiple gill slits? Like, what's the potential function of that? So, do, 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 do. let's see. Do, 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 do. This is talking about frill sharks again. Do, 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 do. Okay, here we go. Most fossils of agnathans, so like jawless fish, and some fossils of acanth acanthodian. Uh, support the presence of multiple gill clefts, and the sea lamprey, which is in the class uh, Petromyzontida, has seven gill clefts. So, like very ancient, ancient, ancient fish. Like jawless fish are like really, really, really old. Like hagfish and lampreys are really old. Um, have multiple gill uh, gill clefts. Uh, however, uh, chimeras, like the rabbit fish, have just one. 
the phylogenetic tree suggests that the multiple gill clusters have been maintained by species to species increase and decreases in both uh, Petromyzonta uh, and Neoslachy lineages. Okay. It's not really telling us why this change. Hmm. No, it doesn't tell us why. I thought they were going to tell us like a guess in terms of like why this happened. Oh. No. No, I don't see anything. Yeah, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm kind of seeing like what's going on, but I'm not seeing why this has happened. So, we won't dwell on this for a long period of time. It's saying, so really briefly, if I'm reading that correctly, um, it's saying that actually like cow sharks, like hexantroforms, and uh, hexantroforms like the cow shark and the frill shark, um, have kind of like an evolved upper draw, um, but it, it doesn't really explain like the gill slit question, so... Um, so this is already 10 o'clock. I think I'm just going to switch back to footage really quick. But it's a really cool question, though. So, um, and I do like this chart. I do really like this kind of phyl phylogenetic tree seeing how, um, you know, these different kinds of sharks did split up. So again, the Batoid split up in the Triassic period. The Galeomorphs split off from the Squalomorphs in the Jurassic period. And then in the Cretaceous period, we have our modern hexantroforms evolving um, where they're retaining the higher number of gill slits. Um, so it, it seems like my guess, based on the fact that, again, like, uh, lampreys have multiple gill slits, is that there's something about the five gill slits that just might be more efficient, since, um, galeomorphs have evolved a, f a, like, the evolved trait is fewer gills, um, and that, like, chimeras have also done that too, the evolved trait is fewer gill slits, um, and then, like, you know, I mean, this is kind of a stretch, but like bony fish, you know, they only have like the gill covering. So, but I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, they didn't really explain like why it happened in terms of like what the physiological reasoning would be. So, but we'll go back to footage really quick, but I think it's a really cool question. Um, and I really appreciate it, Minjus, because it's, it's super cool. Um, let me catch up on the comments, by the way, because uh, I, I was just focused on that so much that... Um, Let's see. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Um, oh, this is cool. Uh, yeah, it feels wrong to call them primitive when they still have such highly evolved features. Yeah, it's, it's like, I mean, yeah, actually, like, because um, that paper, uh, they did make an interesting point that maybe the jaw structure of Hexantra forms is actually, you know, derived or like evolved um it's not really retaining the ancient trait but it's actually something more so like i don't want to say sophisticated it always, the language around evolution always gets really tricky um you got to be careful like how to say it but um but uh but yeah so uh, a bit ago i was doing something on the evolution of jaw jaw and shark gill arches part of the timeline I never thought to look at how different it could be across shark groups yeah, so I love the comparisons um, across different groups as far as, like, when they split up. Um, and I love the question. There are a couple papers we saw last year that kind of asked the question, like, why they split up. Um, one really cool thing, I think my favorite example of, like, a radiation event is uh, carcharaniforms replacing lambdaforms in the Mediterranean. Um, like, back when I think the Mediterranean was colder... Um, and I forget specifically when in the geologic timeline this was, uh, but I think back when the Mediterranean was colder, um, it was more of like a landiform dominated environment. And then when 
the um, water is warmed up and it became actually more of a subtropical environment, Carcharaniforms came in and really diversified, and you know this is part of like there was a lot of like uh, a flourishing of Carcharaniforms in tropical environments, and they became really successful in warm water tropical environments. So, um, oh, and don't, don't apologize. That's all your comment. Like like uh, there there's no there's no the nice thing is there's no such thing as derailing the stream. It's 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 a genuine study party. So um, it's it's uh, it's we're just chilling out and having fun with sharks. So. Um, so there's no, there's no real structure. We just talk about sharks and we go where the wind takes us. So, um, Howard, I have a lot of teeth from the Galearina day. Oh yeah. It's from the, um, is that, so Galearina day is, um, I, I cannot believe I'm blanking on this. Cause those are, that, that is the, um, Howard Pristis is a Galearina, right? Am I, am I losing my mind? Yeah. Yeah. Howard Pristis is Galearina, right? Galeo Rhinidae. Hound sharks, yeah. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna press. Oh, I'm losing it. Hemipristus. Sorry, Hemipristus is Hemigaleidae. Galeo Rhinidae is hound sharks. Like, no. What? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Gamma Rhinus Triacidae. Wait a minute. <laughs> they. Is this a. Hold on. Wikipedia is unusually good with shark classification. Um. Is Galearinidae no longer a valid family? Am I... Is that correct? Hold on. Also, I think the music paused. Let me fix that really quick. As I puzzle over Galearinidae. Hold on. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um... Let's see. Hemigaleidae is weasel sharks. I know Galearinidae is a thing. Triacidae. Proskiliidae. Let's see. <laughs> No, I don't think you misspelled it, Howard. I think, um, I think you might be correct, and the classification may have updated, as, as it always does. Um, let's see. Galearina scalius is the taupe shark. Um, what species do you have, Howard, in Galearinidae? Because you're you're like you're absolutely right that 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 they do that they do fiddle with the nomenclature a lot. Um. Is it is it Galerinus or is it um, Hemipristus? Um, sorry, I'm very curious. I'm very curious about this. Sorry, sorry, sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just uh, I'm very curious about this because like I've I've definitely heard of Galerinidae before, but I don't. It doesn't look like it's a a recognized family now, um, but I feel like it was at one point. Um, it definitely sounds very familiar. So. Um, yeah, let, let me know in the comments because I'm I'm very, I'm very curious about that. Um, sorry, sorry to be putting on the spot. It's just like like it's it's just one of those things where it's like I'm very curious if this is yet another example of shark taxonomy being revised. On the one hand, it's really cool when it gets revised, 
Um, but on the other hand, it's also like a little maddening where it's like, oh my gosh, like when does it end? You know? So, um, and again, like the biggest ones in my lifetime have been the revision of, um, the sand tiger shark and the tiger shark. Uh, so tiger sharks being in gather Saturday day and then sand tiger sharks being in, um, uh, car day. So, but this is a cool uh, shot of six skill sharks. Um, again, in a shallow water environment. This is a YouTuber called Laura James. Puget Sound near Redondo, Washington. This is cool. That's actually really cool. I'm used to this being more of an Atlantic species, so it kind of boggles my mind to see six skill sharks as a Pacific um, kind of species. So, super, super cool. Uh, it was kind of fun for me personally. Um, I did my first uh, snorkel. Uh, it's not really a snorkel trip. It was just kind of a trip in general. But I did snorkeling in Washington last year. And it's kind of cool to see this species swimming in, you know, somewhat familiar kinds of water. Um, I don't recognize these crabs, these big beefy crabs. But I'm kind of looking out for other animals that might be familiar faces. Oh, wow, look at that. He's got a crab. Look at that. Oh, actually, no, he's competing with the crab for meat. So that is a very brave crab hanging on to. <laughs> That's a great clip. Oh, man, I would lose it seeing these. So what's kind of cool about Washington is uh, Washington is very famous for orca whales. And it also, compared to some attitudes on the other side of the continent, um... I believe it doesn't have as high a shark biodiversity as the Atlantic. And I thought, if I'm not mistaken... Oh, this is cool. I'll rewind in a second. If I'm not mistaken, I think the presence of orca whales is in some ways a deterrent to some sharks. Um, where orca whales are predators of certain shark species. And so that partially may be a factor in terms of why there might not be as many sharks in the West Coast. But anyway, I got excited and paused because um, this is a really cool shot. It's very brief, but you can see the reflective eye of the six skill shark in this particular shot. Look at that. So the eye glowing in the dark in the light. Um, we'll rewind one more time just to get a really good view of it because I do want to see it. It's also kind of fun seeing, um, this is the second video with divers with six skill sharks. Um, again, I'm used to six skill sharks being like giant deep water species. And, oh, there we go, that reflective eye. It's so cool. And there's another crab hanging on for dear life, competing with the six skill shark for that piece of meat. It's so cool. Ah, it's such a good clip. That's so cool. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I didn't think you could... Oh, look at that! This is a Pacific Spiny Dogfish. Look at that. Squalus uh, Suckleye. Look at that. That's a surprise. Very cool. Uh, recently delineated from the um, classic Spiny Dogfish from the Atlantic. So Squalus Acanthes. So uh, that was a really cool piece of footage, actually. So. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Howard, I just saw your comment. Lots of Galearhinus. So, yes. Okay, so that's probably what it is. Physogalea not Hemigalea day, but at the time I thought there might be a relationship with the Hemigalea. It's a very small T for the most part. Yes, so Galearhinus is now um, a Triacidae, right? Okay. So Galearhinus is a school shark. Um, or the... Is that the taupe shark? Yeah, taupe shark. There we go. I'm used to it being called the taupe shark. But um, that is now classified as a triacid. But um, it's so, it's like, I, 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 I'm sure it probably was um, given its own family at some point. Um, let me double check Sharks of the World, making sure that's also what they say. Um, but that makes total sense that um, they probably, it probably was Gailey Day, and they probably changed it. 
later, so uh, which is quite irritating. I mean, it's like irritating. It's cool because it's it's more accurate later, but it's also irritating on some level. Um, where are you? H. Yep. Yep. This is a uh, triacid. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, so it is, so Galerinus is a hound shark now, um, but it probably was in its own family, because I, 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 I'm pretty sure I've heard of Galerinidae before, so. Um, but yeah, uh, th th thanks for sharing, though. I'm sorry for putting it on the spot, but I was just really curious about that, and it's probably taxonomic revision, so. Um, but, um, hey, Roy, Roy, welcome back. Happy New Year. So, uh, we are, I hope you had a great uh, holiday season. It's good to see you back. Um, we are going over the six skill shark tonight. Um, we're, a uh, lot, lot of stuff going on. Uh, we have a new display with a cool horizontal fossil timeline. Um, and lots of, um, lots of fun tangents, actually. Uh, we were talking about, the biggest thing for tonight is we were talking about, like, why is there a difference between six gills and five gills like why from an evolutionary perspective does that matter like why did sharks evolve to have fewer gill slits um or like more like like the majority of sharks have five gill slits why is that a thing versus six or seven gill slits is there something about um is there something advantageous about having fewer gill slits so um is, is a big question um this is a pretty cool species uh we learned tonight that it gives live birth, uh, which is not something I was expecting uh, for six scale sharks. Um, it actually can enter shallow water. It likes to be in deep water near upwelling areas, so areas with like high nutrition or like high nutrient load um, as far as um, areas of high biological productivity. Uh, little six scale sharks, like juvenile six scale sharks, uh, like to be in shallow water sometimes. Uh, but the bigger six scale sharks, they don't really. Uh, they like to stick to deeper water. Sometimes they'll come up towards the surface at night, but uh, for the most part, they don't really like to be in shallow water. Um, they've been implicated in one shark attack, potentially two. Um, and by shark attack, I mean maybe like, you know, a bite, you know, and it might have been like a. Whoops, sorry. My screen kind of disappeared for a second. A bite, so like maybe, um, let me make sure everything's cool. Um, so uh, it was, I believe, in Washington State, uh, and I, we don't know the circumstances of like how it happened in terms of like, was it a provoked bite? Is it unprovoked? Uh, we're seeing a lot of footage of divers with the species. So this is one. Oh, thanks, Howard. Uh, one was provoked. Interesting. So thank you. Uh, yeah, do you know the story behind it in terms of, um, I'm assuming a diver is probably harassing the shark, like uh, maybe swimming too close to it, maybe grabbing its tail, maybe petting it, like doing things that no responsible marine, like like scuba divers should be doing. Um, for the most part, it's, it's, I know it's tempting to touch things. Um, I myself have been guilty of touching things, um, but at the same time, it's like, it's really important to respect marine life and um, just let it come to you, if at all, uh, but don't pursue it and don't touch it. So I'm curious if, uh, if you have many more details, please please feel free to share in the chat because I would love to learn more details about that incident. Because um, I'm curious if someone maybe swam too close to it, maybe assumed that, oh, it's a big sluggish shark, it's probably fine. Um, Okay, gotcha. I came across that note in my research. Awesome. So, yeah, that makes sense. It actually makes sense because it's like, if, if, if it's just one attack in the whole history of the shark uh, species, then it's probably, the fact that it's provoked is probably, that, that, that tracks with me. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of footage of six hill sharks on YouTube, actually. Um, it, it took me a little time to find, but... Um, we saw some pretty cool clips already. Uh, this is a nice one from Science Vo. Subscribe. Um, of feeding behavior of six seal sharks at a base uh, bait station. Uh, these are cool. Uh, one thing we were talking about earlier is uh, they do have a unique jaw shape and an extremely unique tooth shape. Uh, I'll pull up the teeth later, uh, Roy, so you can see. 
But the jaw is kind of funny because it almost looks like these sharks are like smiling, you know? Like they almost have kind of like this crooked smile a little bit if you get a good angle on the jaws. Um, this is really cool to see this particular individual towards the bottom um, doing kind of like a wiggling motion. This is reminiscent of dogfish. Dogfish do this where they'll bite on something and twist their bodies back uh, like round and round to tear into tear, tear a chunk off of that prey item. So um, that kind of reminds me of like an alligator or crocodile's death roll a little bit. So, but it makes sense with like the six skill shark's tooth type. Um, if we take a look at it really quick, um, this is a one tooth has about eight to twelve um, cusplets or eight to twelve twelve blades per tooth, um, which is really cool. If you have this kind of working in a single line or row, um, we have this on shark references, like a whole jaw set. There we go. There we go. Uh, there we go. Okay. There we go. Yeah, so if you imagine, like, just being sheared by multiple rows of these teeth. And what's kind of interesting is that they're not interlocking. Like, dogfish teeth are interlocking, but these look a little bit more spaced out. But they also looked a bit, they look a bit sharper. They don't have, like, the broad, like, crushing edge that dogfish teeth do. Um, these are definitely, you know, just pure blades. Um, but if you have, like, a belt of these blades, like, tearing into something as the shark does that movement, uh, it's probably very effective as far as, like, shearing off a big chunk of prey. But I got excited seeing that behavior um, in that piece of footage because it is reminiscent of dogfish. And uh, we found out earlier that uh, six skill sharks, um, like other Hixantia forms, are, um, you know, close, more closely related to dogfish than other more modern sharks. Um, there's um, squalomorphs, uh, squalomorphs, so they are in a shared clad with dogfish, angel sharks, and saw sharks that's a bit distinct from the other shark species like great whites, uh, bull sharks, uh, whale sharks, and uh, bullhead sharks. So, Oh, this is interesting. Uh, this That was really brief, but I think that was a, kind of a good shot of a tag. Uh, from the top right screen, you can see someone... There we go. So uh, you can see someone doing a... like. It looks kind of violent, but... Um, actually, you know what? That might not be a tag. That might be a plug. Okay. That might be... That is a tissue plug. And you can see the puncture mark. Okay, so yeah, th that's interesting. So that that looks kind of violent, but it's it. This is that make this is a research thing where. Um, so I'm assuming this is more kind of like a, a scientific footage, but um, that spear going into the shark and leaving that perfectly circular round hole um, with it bleeding. I know it's kind of sad to see, but that is a tissue plug. Uh, so the scientists stabbed the shark with that spear. And it has kind of like a little compartment where it takes out like a little plug of flesh. And this is used for genetic analysis, uh, uh, tissue content analysis. It can be very useful um, uh, as a way for a way to get like a fresh sample of DNA without like killing an individual species. Um, so it is something that's pretty common in marine biology for larger animals where you do not want to like kill a, an animal you don't want to kill a shark or like a dolphin uh, this is something that's kind of common with dolphins um, you don't want to kill that individual but you do want to take like a fresh tissue sample for uh, s some kind of science as far as like genetic testing or tissue testing um, finding molecules um, or like like in the, or in the tissue like toxins or, or anything like that um, that, that's, that's really cool actually that's something we've never seen before as far as like a scientist taking a tissue sample um, but that's that's what that was as far as that kind of uh, jabbing motion uh, in this particular piece of footage so which is pretty cool uh, again we've never seen that before on the stream so um, new piece of science for 2024 so uh, Roy Roy are um, Cow sharks older relative to dogfish? Uh, very good question. Uh, we had... A, did I close this out? No, thankfully I did not. So we actually... To answer your question, we did find this really cool study 
where we have the hexantra forms that broke off from the rest of the squalomorphs uh, in the Cretaceous period. Um, so this little node right here is where hexantra forms like um, the six skill sharks or cow sharks broke off from the rest of the squalomorphs, including dogfish. So um, in one sense, they kind of are more like sister clads. So they kind of um, broke off from each other. Uh, they, they broke off from each other. So in one sense, you could say they're probably not technically older. They're probably as old um, in, in one sense. So, um, but to answer your question, this is a pretty cool chart, uh, kind of showing the phylogenetic relationship between hexantiforms, the other squall morphs, and then other shark species, uh, including the galeomorphs. So, but yeah, this is really cool footage. Uh, let me catch up on some other comments as well. So, do 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 do. Oh, this is cool. Uh, Howard, there's good footage on YouTube of cow sharks uh, ramming a submersible that got too close to whale fall. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, and then, uh, Howard, um, I just saw you answer your question. Uh, yes, cow sharks are uh, older relative to dogfish. So, I, I, you, you know fossil timelines uh, better, better than I do, honestly. So, um, that, like, like, that would make sense as far as um, maybe, like, dogfish in the squall morphs evolving later within that clad as opposed to and then the like the hexantra forms maybe being established um earlier so um awesome um that that makes sense um let's see uh <laughs> i just see this clip of a six skill uh eating a sea star wow that's really cool um, Minjus, doesn't it uh, also patch up super quick, or are we thinking of something completely different? Uh, if you're referring to the t the tissue plug, um, I think you are correct because it is such a small tissue size. So I think you are correct um, as far as the tissue plug goes. If that, if that, if you're referring to that, so um, this is a really cool piece of footage. Um, this is from a channel called Sharky Jones. I picked it because even though it's older and grainier, it is a six wheel shark biting a cable, which I thought was a really cool thing to see. So, and also you could tell just from the clip, it's a pretty big individual. Um, so I just thought that's really cool. Another thing we learned, uh, it's not very distinct in this clip, but, um, Six skill, uh, blunt nose six skill sharks have like a white stripe kind of along their lateral line towards the back, and that's something that's actually used to distinguish the species, which I never knew before. I never knew that that actually could be used as a identifying marker. So, um, but I actually love kind of like grainy 90s, 80s. Uh, this is probably this is probably 90s or 2000s. Um, footage like this it just feels like older you know like classic you know we're just starting to explore the deep ocean kind of science so very cool um this might be the clip you were talking about howard or maybe one of them this is an awesome piece of footage of a six skill shark very close to a summer submersible look at that that's actually quite terrifying and yet awesome um, I've said this a couple times last year. I would love, love someday, somehow, some way, that is safe to be in a uh, deep sea submersible uh, to observe deep sea sharks or any kind of deep sea wildlife. I would love it. So uh, it, it's that's something kind of like on my bucket list a little bit. Um, you know, something to do someday. I'm not really sure how or where, um, but. Oh, man, look at that. Can you imagine being in the sub and this this is right outside your door? Oh, and that's a really good shot of the eye. Uh, we learned earlier that six skill sharks have uh, fluorescent uh, eyes, which is pretty interesting. Um, we saw a really cool clip earlier of um, the eyes being very reflective. So we shine lights on them. They uh, glow in the darkness. But this thing is massive. Look at this. And it's kicking up all of this sediment. Very silty, very fine, 
Oh, and you know what? There is a tiny... I think there's another shark in this clip. Hold on. I think I just saw another shark. Right there. Um, I think that's another shark. Oh, sorry. Hold on. That is another shark. Okay. It's really brief. <laughs> sorry, that's actually really exciting. I know we're focused on the giant six skill shark, but there's another shark in this clip. Um, I'm assuming it's a cat shark, like a deep sea cat shark. Very tiny, but there he is. Look at him. Uh, oh, let's slow this down, actually, because um, that, that's, that's too fast. That's really cool. Uh, nope, not subtitles. I'm really glad that YouTube allows you to slow things down. I am not glad that YouTube uh, has a crap ton of ads. Does anybody else feel like the ads have gotten a lot worse this year or in the past couple of months? Um, oh, there we go. There's that cat shark. That's so cool. There's no way I can identify it to species level, but it is. I, I do think it's a cat shark. Look at him. Look at that. Just the, the way it's moving, it's a bit sinusoidal. I don't think a smaller dogfish would move like that. It also looks kind of colorful. It has this nice little beige pattern. Hold on. One more time. Sorry. All right, that's cool. I know there's a giant shark in the background, but I just want to say that's really cool to see like a secret shark in this, in this piece of footage. Um, yeah. That's awesome, actually. So, all right. But yeah, does anybody feel like the ads have gone worse? Like, like, uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, right, right. Oh, the ads are a lot worse than before. Uh, Minjus, yes. I feel like they're constantly doubling how many ads that show up. Howard, more and more ads everywhere. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if anything happened or, hey, Bruce, welcome. I didn't, I didn't see you. What's up, man? Welcome back. Happy New Year. Oh, my gosh. So, um, yeah, uh, we're talking about six skill sharks tonight. I was just asking about, um, ads cause I've definitely, I've definitely noticed it's gotten like really bad. Like, um, like, like, oh yeah, Bruce. Oh yeah. About the ads. Like, uh, there's a new thing where it's like, you have to, what is it? If you watch two minutes of unskippable ads you'll have skippable ads in the middle of your video or like fewer ads in the the rest of your video it's bad i, I it's it's kind of unbelievable and i'm really nervous about youtube not now i don't think anytime soon but like let's say a decade from now i'm or decades from now i'm very new, nervous about youtube going the way of cable where there's just a lot of ads interrupting everything like like it's it's just it's pretty bad um i've, I've definitely noticed in the past i want to say maybe two months or three months it's gotten a lot worse so uh yeah it's been crazy uh Roy, Roy, i just saw your comment about a uh, cookie cutter shark um it's a good guess i think the only my only hesitation is as far as this mystery shark Hold on. Where was he? I think he was earlier in the video. It's kind of funny. We have this beautiful, giant six skill shark here, but I'm mesmerized by the tiny mystery shark. I think you can kind of briefly see a more raised fin. Like, cookie cutter sharks are famous kind of for being that cigar shape, kind of like that straight line. And I think this particular mystery shark, this tiny little guy appearing in the video, I think it's so flexible and yet you could still see like a second dorsal fin. I, I'm i still guessing cat shark. I think cookie cutter is a great guess because it is also a deep water shark and it's beige. But I think this guy, because it's so sinusoidal, um, I'm still guessing cat shark uh, as, as my best guess, but I don't know what kind. So... Um, but yeah, but it's a good guess though. Um, this is a really cool thing from the EV Nautilus. Um, if you guys, if you guys, I mean, I'm sure anyone who watches the stream loves ocean content. 
Um, anything related to the Nautilus or Okeanos or NOAA, there's awesome footage, uh, deep sea footage. Um, there's actually hours of it on YouTube. I highly recommend those channels. Uh, they're very cool, very soothing. You can listen to original commentary from the scientists on board, or you could just mute it and just play some music and have this incredible footage on in the background. Um, it's super, super cool. But uh, I love this clip of a six scale shark uh, from Puerto Rico um, in clearly deep water. Uh, it's, it's, it's awesome to see um, the, this, this particular species in, like, in one of the like, Okeanos clips. Um, so, or sorry, in the uh, EV Nautilus clip. So. Oh, I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah, uh, I just saw your comment um, about pausing the other piece of footage. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Do, 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 do. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's do a freeze frame. Because uh, now that I slowed it down, it should be easier to see. Okay. I wonder if I could do... Okay, so there he is right here. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Okay, it's going to be hard to get kind of like an angle. Oh, actually, you know what? Okay. I know it's kind of blurry, but I think that's an eye, and it looks like it has kind of like a collar-like pattern. Oh, you know what? We would be re we would be champions if we can get this. Okay. Okay. We first, let's figure out where this is, if we can. Uh, Cape Luther Institute. We managed to achieve history tagging an animal from a submersible for the first time ever. Six wheel shark. Dean Grubbs. Okay, very familiar name. Our friend, a good friend, Jess. Jess Myers. Um, I believe she. Yeah, she. She was a. She was a student of his, I think, if I'm not if I remember correctly. Do, 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 do. Bahamas. Okay. Okay. So, okay, uh, in partnership with Cape Urethra Institute, let me make sure that's Bahamas. It says um, at CEI Bahamas. I think we could do this, guys. I actually think we can actually maybe get this to species level. Okay, so Cape Le and I can't really say this right, Cape Eleuthera is in the Bahamas. So so what we're doing now is actually exactly what you should be doing as far as like if you have a mystery fish, in this case our shark, you first try you first want to identify the location. Um, that is going to easily narrow down a lot of different options. Um, so assuming this is in the Bahamas, and I think that's a safe assumption to make since this is a project in coordination with um, Cape Eleuthera, and um, they keep saying Bahamas in the description. Let's assume that this is Bahamian waters. Um, and let's check out cat sharks of the Bahamas. Uh, sure, let's just check this out. Let's just click on it for, for fun. Nope, it doesn't have. Let's keep it a pin in this. The dwarf cat shark, Skinnerinus torii. I want to find a good source. Yeah, okay. Uh, I wish I had a good... Sh uh, Sharks of the Bahamas. Let's just do Sharks of the Bahamas. And just to make sure there's nothing's in suspense. Oh, no. We didn't have an image of that. Scalarinus torii. Images. Okay. It could be this. Um, this is tricky. Sharkreferences.com is a good resource, so we can check that. 
so Scalarius torii lives in the same kind of area. It does have blotches here. They're a little bit indistinct, but it does live in the same area. So that is a possibility for this clip because this particular individual shark does have, you can see like the white belly, kind of like a beige back and then a couple blotches. It could be this. I do really want a checklist of sharks of the Bahamas. So let's, just to kind of cross reference from a good resource. Um, I don't really know, no offense to sharkcider.com, but I don't really know what that is. Let's just click on it really quick. Uh, I don't really know this resource. Uh, it has a lot of shallow water sharks, but it doesn't have like a complete list. I really want something that's like a complete list. Do, 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 do. I don't know it's almost 11, but it's just Sharks of the Bahamas checklist. You know what? As popular as the Bahamas are, I'm kind of like a little surprised. Uh, Caribbean Shark Identification Guide. There we go. Let's just do that. There we go. Let's just do this. from Noah. Uh, no. This is really small. Nope. Nope, that's not really comprehensive. Uh, those are those are sharks that you fish for. It's not really like a good like science guide, like a good like field guide. Um Yeah, these are all like resorts and ads for that. Um Didn't I have I thought I had Shark Research Institute is based in the Bahamas, if I'm not mistaken, species. Uh, that seems like, yeah, this is a global distribution, so that's not really going to be helpful. Shoot. Okay. Sharks, let's see. Okay. Field guide to sharks of the Bahamas. Uh, that's a book. That's kind of a cool book, though. Um, oh, hey, this is actually a really cool book. Uh, I didn't even know this was a thing. Uh, but this is from David A. Ebert and Mark Dando. These are great uh, shark people. So, Field Guide to Sharks Raising Chimeras of the East Coast of North America. I might have to get that. That's actually really cool. 173 species. Very cool. Okay. I promise I won't dwell on this too, too much. I'm just kind of curious about... Um, Shark is a shallowest coastal species in Florida. Uh, these are books. It's it's cool to see that there's all these like neat books, but like um, uh, this is not gonna have cat sharks in it, but I just want to see what this is. This won't have cat sharks, right? Okay. It's kind of a shame. With, for as much as we know about sharks, it is really a shame that there's... Sometimes there's just, like, not a good checklist of sharks in certain places of the world. So, um, so anyway, all that being said, um, our best guess is Scalarinus torii, uh, which is... Which one is that again? The dwarf cat shark, I think. Scalarized torii. It's also known as the white spotted cat shark and the Cuban cat shark. So, um, this little clip could be that. Um, it's a shark that has blotches and a beige back. 
It's very tiny. It swims in a sinusoidal way that I feel like is very much a cat shark. It definitely has an upper and lower lobe on the caudal fin uh, from that brief clip. So I, I really feel like it's a cat shark. I unfortunately can't find a way to narrow it down. Um, but this clip on YouTube, if you guys want to uh, take the reins and we can uh, touch base on this next week, this is from OceanX, massive deep sea shark checking out our submarine. Um, even though this is an awesome clip about an enormous uh, six scale shark, there's a mystery shark that is really tiny towards the end of the clip. And I think it's a cat shark, but the thing that needs to be done that we probably won't be able to do tonight um, is cross-referencing cat sharks that live in the Bahamas with the footage and to see if there's a cat shark that has like a blotchy pattern that matches the footage. Um, the, our best guess is the dwarf cat shark, um, which is a pretty good educated guess, but um, it may or may not be that. So it's kind of funny stealing the spotlight from our enormous six scale shark. And again, this is awesome footage. Um, concerning like an incredible species, um, it's almost kind of like it kind of makes me think of Jurassic Park a little bit, where it's like you're in your vehicle and then like a T Rex is right outside. It's just it's so cool, but I really like this little mystery shark that we have going on here. So um, it's a great challenge, uh, really cool, really cool um, um, flexing of your marine biology muscles. Um, you know, cross referencing cat sharks of the Bahamas with what that species could be. So. Um, if you guys find out, just uh, please leave a comment in the video um, as the video gets published. All the live streams are published at the channel, so uh, please leave a comment in the video, or uh, we could talk about it next week as well, because I, I just think it's really cool. So it's fun It's fun to have that. So, um, And I'm sorry, I did not see the comments. Uh, so uh, Roy Royale yeah, looks like a cat shark. Bruce agrees it's a cat shark. Bruce, great question. How deep was it? That's an excellent question excellent question actually because it's not just the location but like depth um do, 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 do. let's see Deep grubs. it does not say how deep it is you know what is there any comments no they're all talking about the, the giant shark which is totally understandable is there anything on the screen that has a indicator? No. So based on the silt, I definitely feel like this is not the sunlit zone. Um, I would say this is below 200 meters. I cannot tell just from the silt alone how deep this is, but I think it is safe to say it is below 200 meters um, or was that 600 feet? I think it's safe to say it's below that, but awesome clip. But yeah, that's a really good question, Bruce. That's an excellent question um, as far as like, cause that's another thing, just like location might help narrow things down. Depth would really help narrow things down. So excellent question. Um, let's see, pronounced second dorsal fin, or sorry, pronounced second fin. I think it did um, just based on the movement in the clip, so. Oh, uh, Roar, I'm literally trying to dig into it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. Bruce, I'm going to screenshot the critter and post on a marine biology subreddit. Yes, please do. It's it's a really cool mystery, actually. Please do. Oh, men just have to leave early, but so happy to study parties are back. Yes, thank you so much for joining tonight. It's good to see you. Welcome back, and Happy New Year. So I hope you have a good night, Minjus. Uh, we'll come back. Shoot, next week. Uh, what shark should we do next week, guys? Um, please leave a comment on what species you want to cover next week. Because um, I just realized... Sorry, I got so excited about this that I didn't realize we're getting so close to 11. And uh, we got to pick a shark for our next stream. So uh, please leave some suggestions. Um, yes, uh, what shark for next week? Um, let's see. P just to kind of help things out... I kind of think some kind of heterodontophore might be cool, um, but I'm, I'm open to anything. Um, uh, <laughs> the car, <laughs> um, I, I misread it. So I, cat shark is a good, that's a good choice actually. You know what, Bruce? That's an excellent choice. So I don't, I don't know if you meant. I think you meant the cat shark. I, I see car shark, but I think you meant the cat shark. And I think you're absolutely right. 
So let's do it. The dwarf cat shark. That is, that is an excellent choice. No, I think I Bruce. I think you're absolutely right that we should do this one because uh, that actually will be a really cool follow up to the mystery. So let's do the dwarf cat shark Skillerinus torii. That will be an awesome shark to do next week um, because like that. Just in case that's the one that we saw in that clip. Um, that would just be an excellent one to cover. So, um, we have a couple minutes left, so I do want to end on this piece of footage. Uh, I do want to do a blitz through, um, because we, we went on a really, a lot of really cool rabbit holes, so I, I, I do want to do a blitz through some of the Blunt Nose uh, Six Skill Shark profiles just to make sure we cover some of the basics and give this species the attention it deserves. Um, it's cool to see that this is, it's a near threatened species. So even though that's not ideal, it's still better than most sharks. Um, part of the reason why it's near threatened is that it's actually very productive compared to sharks, uh, most other shark species. Um, these give live birth and have 40 to a hundred pups. Um, let's just take a real quick look at the assessment detail. Do, 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 do. Blah, 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 blah. Large litters, but an estimated late age and maturity reduces capacity recovery from fishing pressure. Infrequently caught, lives in deep water. Some population reduction. So, you know, it is, it, like, it is overlapping areas of fishing pressure, but again, since it does produce a lot of pups, um, it does help it combat the amount of fishing pressure it gets. So it's really cool to see it's a nearly threatened species as opposed to something a little bit worse. Um, so it's nice to see that for this particular shark. Um, let's see. Feeds nocturnally and ambushes prey. I'm just kind of scanning through this. These are pretty cool photos from Florida Museum of Natural History. Only one documented attack, provoked attack. Uh, the blunt nose six skull shark appears to be at ease in the presence of divers. However, it does not like to have physical contact or to be surrounded by humans and will swim off into deeper waters. It has been reported to snap when touched by divers or, and when caught by fishers. Care should be taken when landing the shark to avoid injury. So that makes sense. And I think it goes back to what Howard said earlier tonight, um, that the shark attack um, that happened was provoked so I'm gonna guess that somebody was just kind of not being very responsible and messing with the species and harassing the species when they really shouldn't be so um, again as a rule of thumb uh, for any kind of scuba diving if you're diving with a large animal like a shark you probably should not be touching it because even if it may seem sluggish um, it can quickly snap at you the best example is nurse sharks um, you know, people think nurse sharks are these big puppy dogs, when in reality, you know, if you touch them and harass them, they will arch, like, like, like they, they will turn around and, like, bite you. Um, and I feel like there's quite a handful of nurse shark bites, kind of, um, that are provoked. So, and then on the other side of things, with a lot of um, reef fish, including um, parrotfish are a really good example, um, they have, they secrete an important mucus that kind of helps um, navigate coral reefs and not get cut up by the razor sharp coral. And if you touch them, you kind of actually take away from their that protective layer. It's kind of like if you touch moths um, or butterflies, you kind of take away some of the scales that kind of help them um, fly or kind of help them um, like I, I think I think with butterflies it's like or moths if you if you if you touch them then you kind of rub some of the scales off that I, I think it is a flight thing um, there's some, there's something that negative that happens when you do that but um, with fish it's uh, especially reef fish it's a protective mucus that if you touch them it kind of removes the mucus and it actually you know makes them more susceptible to being cut up by coral or um, other rocky things in the seabed so again. Just as a rule of thumb, it is better to leave things undisturbed and to respect uh, all sea life from a distance and um, have a great dive, uh, but just, you know, be respectful towards the awesome animal that you are diving with. So, but, um, 
Oh, hey, uh, Roy Roy, biggest question about the cow shark, why lack a first dorsal fin? That's a good question, and I'm kind of curious, is it, the, do they lack a first dorsal fin, or do other sharks, do they evolve a second dorsal fin? So, because um, you think about, like, ancestral traits, um, in that paper we were reviewing earlier, uh, they made a point that uh, hagfish and lampreys, which are the most ancient of fish, if you will, um, that exist today, um, they have multiple gill slits, they don't have a dorsal fin, um, so I'm not really sure if the single fin is an adaptation where they lo uh, this, this group of sharks lost a second dorsal fin, or if every other shark evolved a second dorsal fin um, as the mo more modern adaptation. I'm not really sure, but it's a really, really good question. So, But we're getting close to 11, so I think we'll wrap up for tonight. But uh, next week will be the dwarf cat shark, Scalarhinus torii, and some follow-up on the mystery shark from the submarine. But thank you guys so much for watching. It's really good to see you guys um, all back here for 2024. Um, I was low-key a little nervous about taking, like, almost a month off uh, and, like, having January 15th be, like, the day coming back because, um, you know, it, it's just such a large period of time and with the holidays that... Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't blame anyone if, if they missed the stream. So it's really cool to see so many of our, like, key players back, you know. Like, I like it's awesome to be with you all. It's really cool to be starting 2024 off right. Uh, we're in Season 2 of Dr. Jaws Live with a whole new year of sharks and a whole new year of fun, new guests, uh, a lot to look forward to. So, oh, thanks, thanks, Bruce. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that comment. I'm going to star that. So thank you. But it's a delight to be with you all again. It's really great to be back. I hope you guys have a great week as well. And uh, we're back. We're going to start the year off uh, like with just more sharks and more fun. So happy 2024. But thank you guys for watching the Six Skill Shark stream. I um, hope you have a great week. And I'll see you soon. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> oh, thanks, Roy. <laughs> Good night, guys. Have a great week. And we'll do the Cat Shark next week. But take care.